Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, thanks everyone for coming along tonight. Great to see such a good roll up. This is only the second time I've actually spent some time in, uh, in Mildura and I'm really enjoying it down here. It's a great part of the world. I think I'm gonna have to come back and do some more fishing down here. Might have to find a better guide than we had this morning though. What do you reckon, Jonathan? I'm gonna uh, have a talk to you about a more positive aspect, I guess. We, we, you know, we look at a lot of negative things and habitat destruction and uh, uh, fish numbers declining and things like that. But I, and fishermen always talk about the good old days, you know. Um, we all hark back to the times when there were, we, we believe, anyway, through our selective fishermen's and fisher ladies' memories that the, the past was always better than today. But sometimes it pays to actually have a, a little bit closer look at that. And I'm actually going to argue that we're living in the good old days now if we, if we look after it properly and do the right thing. And I think that there are some, some fairly positive um, signs and messages. And uh, I think it was Jonathan that actually posted the question on the Ozfish website a few weeks ago, do you reckon the fishing was better 100 years ago than it is today? And, and it got a lot of response. And most people, of course, said yes, the fishing was better 100 years ago than it is today. And it's a hard one, because even though Jonathan thinks I was around 100 years ago, I wasn't, and none of us were. Um, but it, it, it's a, an interesting thing to think about if you could jump in a time machine and go back. And I reckon most fishermen play this game sometimes in their mind. And I know that I would love to get in a time machine with today's gear, uh, my boat and a sounder and a bait caster and a spin rod and a whole bunch of lures and go back 200, 500, 1,000 years. Can you imagine fishing this river when it was often clear enough to see down into the snags and see cod holding on a snag 10 metres down in the water and see schools of, of silver perch that took a, two or three days to pass a given point when they were moving upstream to spawn and things like that would have been amazing. But 100 years ago, I'm not so sure about because 100 years ago is the 1920s and we'd already done a lot of damage uh, by 100 years ago. So I think if I was going to jump in my time machine, I'd go back further than, than 100 years. I'd go back to at least the time that European settlers first moved into these areas to see what the, what the conditions were like in those days. I, I think it would have been pretty amazing. Um, of course, the indigenous people had been catching fish and supporting a big part of their diet from fish out of rivers like this for thousands of years before that and they never put the, the fish under any, any great stress because there just weren't enough of them and their, their techniques for taking them weren't sophisticated enough and they just lived in harmony with it and caught fish. Uh, and the early European settle, settlers uh, chronicled the way that they caught fish. And you can see how important uh, the native fish were to indigenous people by just how often they turn up in their art um, and their mythology and their, their stories. There's even a story in, in Aboriginal mythology that the Murray itself was caused and was created by a giant Murray cod that was being chased by a, a warrior with a spear and it was the tail beats of this giant cod that actually made all the bends of the Murray River. So it's a, it's a great story. And, you know, they were very, very significant to the Indigenous people. And when the, um, when the Europeans arrived, they were fascinated by the whole thing. Um, and watching the way the indigenous people caught fish and, and, uh, and how they utilised them as a food source. And they were really interested in the fish too. They were very different fish to the old world trout and salmon that they were used to from back in Europe. Um, and early naturalists spent a lot of time chronicling the fish. Interestingly, the first Murray cod that was ever scientifically described actually turned out to be a trout cod. Uh, it was caught in the Macquarie River up in central western New South Wales and it threw the scientists into a bit of a quandary for many years because that, that first uh, genetic description of a Murray cod actually turned out to be a trout cod. So then they had to play around with all the scientific names and everything. But um, uh, they were just fascinated by the fish and they're such different fish and such different life cycles as we've seen tonight. Trout and salmon in the, in the old world uh, most of them run to the ocean if given a chance and then the adults push back upstream so it's big strong adults that will jump over stuff to get back up into the rivers to spawn 
and then the little trout and salmon drop back down the river and grow and then ultimately end up in the estuaries or in the ocean or in a big lake or whatever and then they repeat the cycle. Our fish are very, very different to that. Our fish need that same mobility but it's not big spawn ready adults that are trying to push upstream a lot of times, it's often little juveniles that are trying to move upstream and we put all these barriers in their, in their way. And our fish, Murray Cod and Yellowbelly, don't jump up through rapids, you know. They, they don't do spectacular stuff like that. They, they like to stay under the surface and they'll push up through slower flows and around the edges when there's a flood or whatever. And as we've seen tonight, we've put all these barriers in their way that they can't do. And we've tried to build fishways and some of them work and apparently this one doesn't. Uh, <laughs> And you ne need to remember that. I got that message, yeah. And we need, no, seriously though, that's just wrong, especially this far downstream on the Murray. If you've got a, a barrier here that is effectively stopping the migration of fish upstream, it's having a huge impact on the rest of the river. So I really do need to do something about that. So, of course, those early settlers utilised the fish. Uh, they were prolific in those days. They caught lots of them and they ate them. In fact, in some areas there were so many of them they fed them to their stock uh, or used them, dug them into the fields and used them as fertiliser. That's how many fish there were. And We've all seen photos like, like these early ones of um, big, big catches of Murray Cod. Interestingly though, if you look at a lot of those photos, a lot of the fish are not huge. And that's always the way. I mean, in any population of fish, there's always going to be more uh, sub-adult and, and smaller fish than there is the, the monstrous big ones. But, of course, they caught plenty of big ones as well. Um, this one over on the right here, a commercially caught one at Corowa in 1924, 97 pounds. That's a, that's a pretty, big, uh, pretty big cod in anyone's language. But, you know, these guys here with the stringer of fish. Now, this is 1928, 1924, so we're already talking about nearly 100 years ago. Um, and by that stage, there was a heck of a lot of fish being extracted from the water. And I'll tell you now, none of these fish were caught on rod and reel. They were caught on set lines, cross lines, in drum nets, in gill nets. Uh, and they were caught purely to be utilised, to be eaten. A lot of them were sold locally. Some of them were shipped uh, to Melbourne from, uh, from as far afield as this to be sold in the markets down there. So there was a huge extraction. You know, even as more recently, 1958, that's the Astoria Cafe in Echuca and they're, they're um, butchering up some uh, locally caught cod to be served through the cafe. So there was a huge take of fish during that period and a big commercial fishery. A lot of people don't realise that, but there were a lot of commercial fishermen operating throughout the, the inland rivers back in those days. And the numbers, even by the mid-1920s, there were a lot of people observing that the numbers of fish were crashing already and it was getting very, very hard to catch, particularly decent-sized uh, Murray cod. So I wouldn't want to go back 100 years. I don't think you'd necessarily find better fishing. And we'd already done a lot of damage to the environment. There was already a lot of, uh, a lot of farming. There was already water extraction by that stage. So I think the decline started at least 100 years ago. So if you were going to see significantly better fishing, you'd probably have to go back about 150, 200, 250 years. So that's where I'd be setting the controls on my time machine. But then, uh, then the gear started to change. From a, from a selfish angler's point of view, things start to get interesting from about that same period because instead of just being a meat extracting exercise using set lines and cross lines and drum nets, suddenly a few people started to realise that whilst they weren't trout and salmon, these were actually really exciting and interesting fish to catch and people actually started targeting them on lures. Again, originally for a feed, cord line out the back of a little rowboat with an aeroplane spinner on it, especially when the river was running a little bit clearer than normal and the fish were willing to hit a lure and it was a great way to catch fish. Again, they all ended up getting killed and eaten. Um, but then we started, you know, things kept evolving. Uh, we started importing lures from the US, bass lures and, uh, and pike lures from Europe and a few Australian lure makers started to make their own. Uh, that's an Australian lure at the, at the top left there. Uh, cod, something, cod catcher, or, does anyone remember what they were called? What is it? King Cotter, that's it, yeah. 
and they were a jointed lure. Um, they were around in the in the 1940s and 50s, and into the early 60s, and um, people were starting to use more sophisticated tackle to to actually target the fish instead of just a set line or a cross line or a drum net. They were holding a rod and reel in their hand and casting lures. Um, and at, at about the same time, there were media influences. People like Vic McChrystal and Brian P Pratt and Rod Harrison started writing about inland native fish as a sport fishing target. So people were, were using bass style bait caster gear and these imported and locally made lures to cast for these fish and suddenly started recognising that we had a fantastic sport fishery on these inland species and celebrating that fact. Again though, they were still mostly getting kept and killed. Um, there wasn't a heck of a lot of catch and release around at that stage. Now it's about then that I sort of started to get involved in, in, uh, in fishing myself and in writing for fishing magazines and so forth. I started off as a school teacher and that's me, believe it or not, in the foreground there. My first posting was to Burke uh, up on the, uh, the Darling River. Uh, at the end of the 1970s and I couldn't wait to get out there and have a crack at these yellow belly and Murray cod on bait caster gear like I've got there in my hand. Uh, I was really excited to go on and see that kind of fishing and experience it myself. Unfortunately, I arrived about three or four years after the carp arrived in Burke. That was the real carp plague that, that pushed up through the Darling River uh, through the 1970s. And by the time I got there, you could just about walk across the Darling at uh, North Burt Weir on the backs of the carp. They were, as often happens when the first wave of a, uh, an exotic species comes through, they absolutely boomed. They just about displaced everything else. For the year or so that I lived there and fished a lot, um, I probably would have caught 50 to 100 carp for every native fish that I caught. I caught a few yellow belly, I caught a few silver perch, I caught a few small cod, uh, but it was really disappointing fishing. The carp just dominated everything and for that reason I ended up doing a lot more hunting than, than um, fishing and fishing just became a carp extracting uh, process. You just dragged them out of the water and threw them up the bank and killed them. I made it interesting for myself by targeting carp on little, uh, little lures, little selters and things like that and that was, a, that was a bit of fun but it was still really disappointing to see what the carp were doing to the river and, and just the way that they'd uh, displaced the, the native fish. It was, it was quite sad. I saw very, very few decent cod caught. I certainly didn't, I didn't see any actually caught. The only uh, large Murray cod that I saw while I lived in Burke were hanging up on a meat hook in the chillers at the, the local hotel. And the locals up there, when they talked about a Murray cod, they never talked about it being bat long. They always talked about it being bat long because that's when you hang them up, that's how, that's how big they are. And they, they, when they talked about a big cod, it was that long, not that long. So it was not a great time. So I would definitely say that, that 40, 50 years ago, the fishing was nowhere near as good as it is today. Then things started to turn around. We started realising that we had to look after the habitat and the environment the fish lived in, but also we started restocking. Now, restocking is only ever going to be a band-aid solution. You shouldn't need to restock fish uh, in, a, in a natural or even a semi-natural environment if they can spawn and, and, and reproduce and replace themselves. You shouldn't need to stock. But we developed hatcheries so that we could stock fish into man-made impoundments and there were more and more of these dams being built. We know the negative effect of, of dams. You've got thermal pollution downstream from the cold water. You've got the, the stoppages in the flows. You've got taking those highs and lows out of the, the annual flow regime that we know we need to sustain native fish. But you need dams too. If you're going to live the kind of lifestyle that we all wanted to live, we need to irrigate, we needed electricity, so we had dams. We stocked a lot of those dams with native fish and created some pretty amazing recreational fisheries that have continued to boom today and, and have really done wonders for the local economies in, in uh, many, many areas throughout inland Australia. So places like Mulwala. Um, and this kick-started what I call the, the Murray Cod Renaissance, but it's a native fish renaissance in general where we once again realised what a great sport fish we had there. 
and we started being able to catch quite a few more, particularly in these impoundments and bigger and bigger fish. And then social media came along and we were able to, to share our catches of those fish with other people and, uh, and a whole appreciation of, of the Murray Cod and Golden Perch as, as great iconic Australian sport fish really started to spread through the whole angling community. And with it, a whole catch and release ethos I was in my 50s before I finally caught my first metre plus Murray Cod, not too far from here, down in Lock 8, um, back in, I think it was about 19, uh, 2016, 2017, and I caught it out of a kayak, and as you can see, I was pretty stoked. Um, and like a lot of other people, I've really got into the whole chasing cod on lures and specialist tackle and we always let them go now I'm, i shouldn't say that i'll keep out of an impoundment i will keep a 65 or 70 centimeter cod maybe one or two a year and eat them because i do like eating them, like the ones we had tonight even though they were farmed they were really nice i don't see any problem in a put and take fishery in an impoundment with taking an occasional one out but i probably prefer not to out of the rivers these days but you're still allowed to and, and where they're in reasonable numbers there's nothing wrong with taking one in that slot size limit every now and again. It's not just the cod. Uh, golden perch have really boomed in, in the impoundments as well, as we've heard tonight. They actually quite like the still water uh, created by man-made dams and things and grow to enormous sizes that we never saw much of in the rivers. Um, these are from Windermere up near Mudgee in central western New South Wales. Um, that's Copeton Dam up uh, near Inverell. Uh, in the northwest of New South Wales, which has developed as a, a real giant Murray Cod uh, mecca, and a lot of anglers travel there now. And it, it's interesting to watch the fashions and trends come through, through sport fishing. Um, back in the 90s and, and very early 2000s, it, everyone was making the big trip north to go and fish the Barramundi dams in Queensland that have been stocked with barra and were producing all these metre plus barra. 2010, 2011, we had the big flood events and a lot of those barrel went over the wall of the dam. They'll always try and run downstream so they can spawn in the, in the uh, salt water. They've just got that biological imperative built into them. So they lost a lot of the barra. And that attention then switched to the Murray Cod in places like Copeton and Eildon in Victoria and Burrinjuk and Burrindong and a lot of the other dams that were producing a lot of these big Murray Cod. And that became the place to go to catch a metre plus freshwater fish and cod took on that mantle that had previously been held by the barramundi. But there's good news stories in parts of the rivers too, you know, that's a stretch of the, of the Murrumbidgee between um, uh, Wagga and Narandra. Uh, lots of great habitat in there. There's been some restocking. People are doing the right thing and not hauling fish out and killing them uh, anymore and it's starting to boom again as a fishery. A lot of small fish. Uh, Murray cod, trout cod, there's a lot of trout cod in that stretch. There's a reasonable number of golden perch, there's a few silver perch, a lot of carp still unfortunately, but it's all starting to bounce back. And as we saw with uh, the graphs about that um, control reach where, where they'd uh, fixed up the habitat in a section of the upper uh, Murray-Darling system and the fish populations had come back, you can fix things. So it's not, it's not all bad news and you can go out and target you know, you might not catch monsters all the time, but you can catch them. That's my wife. Now, my wife Jo grew up in Darwin uh, and only moved down south with me about 10 years or so ago, and she's taken to Murray Cod fishing like a duck to water. She absolutely loves it. Um, these are some Copeton shots. And surface lure fishing for cod, you know, that no one thought about that 20 odd years ago. There were a few switched on anglers up in the New England area of. of uh, Northwestern New South Wales who were doing it. They were out there catching cod on surface lures, but they kept it pretty quiet. Now it's, it's swept through cod fishing and the thought of catching a metre plus cod off the, you know, off the surface is just amazing. And, and if you've done it and you've experienced it, you'll know it's one of the biggest blasts you can get in, um, in lure fishing. Entire families of lures have been developed uh, specifically to target these big Murray cod. Um, both imported and locally made ones, and, and the gear to use them. So it's been really good for the, for the economy, it's been good for the tackle trade, it's good for tackle shops, it's good for the importers and the manufacturers of the gear. 
There's my wife again. She, she owns the um, status of the biggest cod in our family. She got that 116 uh, off the surface in Copeton a few years ago on a, on a surface lure. She actually caught a 116 and a 109 within 45, 50 minutes of each other. So I think I should just hang my rods up and drive her around and take the photos. She's, she's definitely got the touch. And that's, uh, that's my stepdaughter, Charlotte, um, Joe's daughter, and uh, she... Um, uh, comes to Windermere with us and catches golden perch and that that's what the message I want to get across tonight is that it's not all doom and gloom we can fix things up um, organizations like Ozfish and and the other people that we've been listening to tonight have, have got some of the answers and we know we can definitely make things better um, I would argue that the fishing is actually not too bad uh, at all in a lot of places these days I just went onto social media uh, a couple of days ago and just pulled a few shots that had been up on Facebook and Instagram uh, across the last couple of weeks of people with these massive cod. And there's, you know, there's a lot more than this out there. These are just shots that have come up uh, in the last few weeks of all fish well over a metre, some of them up into the 120s and 130s. And there's lots and lots more on there if you want to look. And the, the big difference is between those photos and the, the old black and white photos I showed you from 100 years ago, every single one of these fish is being released. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that every single one of them is necessarily going to survive, because some of the handling practices probably leave a little bit to be desired, but 85, 90% of those fish are still out there. They're still out there for you and I to catch. They're still out there for our kids and their kids to catch, and if they get the chance to spawn in a riverine uh, environment, then they're going to produce tens of thousands of other cod for future generations to catch. So it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, our inland fisheries face a hell of a lot of challenges, but as we've heard tonight, we're, each year we're understanding more and more about what those challenges are. We know what some of the answers are. We can make what's already a pretty good fishery even better if we all work towards it and look after it and put some pressure on the, on the people that make the decisions. Tell them the fishway down here doesn't work and get it fixed. Fairly basic stuff like that. And environmental flows, they need to be done at the right time and at the right level so that the fish can, can spawn and we're gonna have more and more fish for the future. So let's celebrate the fact that compared to 50 years ago, these are the good old days and if we all work together, they can get even better and we can make sure that our kids and their kids enjoy an absolute golden age of inland fishing. Thank you.